All right, Mike Knox, how's it going? What's up, man? It's good. Hey, glad to have you here, man. Finally, right? Yeah, finally, man. We got a we got a lot of stuff to talk about, man. Well, let's go. Don't leave nothing out. Okay, for sure, for sure, man. Yeah. Well, you know, I kind of just like to get to know you a little bit better and kind of go over, you know, your whole story for everybody who might not be familiar with it. Mm. Um, so can you kind of tell them a little bit about you, where you're from and what it was like for you growing up? Uh, I'm from North Philly. I come from North Philly, the heart of North Philly. Um, I mean, you know, just like kind of like all the other stories. I, you know what I'm saying? I grew up in North Philly in the streets. was running around on my own since I was like 15. Um, Started messing with the music a little bit. Of course, in and out, the juvenile system, and you know what I'm saying, whatever you call it. State, you know, all, all that stuff. But um, you know, for the most part, I just was a regular nigga. You know what I'm saying? Just running around, getting to it. Okay, uh, what was school like for you? School? I ain't like school. For me, school was more so like, I was impatient. I was one of them kids that I didn't want to sit around and listen. So I was just running around, cutting class, you know what I'm saying? Getting, I was trying to make some money, so, you know what I mean? I wasn't really into school too much. I ain't even get my GED to like, uh, to have the feds, as a matter of fact. So, yeah, I wasn't really into school like that at all. Okay, so you dropped out at one point? Yeah, I dropped out. I dropped out like the ninth grade. I dropped out like the ninth grade. Like I said, I was hustling. and just doing what I needed to do to survive. I wasn't really focused on school. Like, that wasn't it for me. Okay, and so you drop out of school, mm -hmm. and you're in the streets at this point, man. You know, what does your family think when they find out that you're in the streets? My mom, she was against it, but she couldn't stop me. You know what I'm saying? She couldn't stop me because I was going to do what I was going to do regardless. You know what I mean? I was hustling. And then at that point, I think in the beginning, she was against it. But, you know, as the money started coming in and I start providing a little bit and doing what I need to do, it kind of changed. So she just kind of... Like, well, if he's going to do what he's going to do, he's his own man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so you, you're out of school. You know, you're in the streets and everything, man. Yeah. You know, you know. do you ever get arrested or does anything like that yeah, happen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started get, getting arrested as a juvenile. My, I think my first arrest was like stealing cars. We was into stealing cars. And this was back when New Jersey Drive was out. We was... Everybody wanted to drive something. We still in cars and I had aggravated assaults. Um, I had a lot of different things going on, you know what I'm saying? But I was in and out of jail a lot, you know what I'm saying, as a juvenile. Uh, then I got shot. I got shot at like, probably like what? I want to say probably like 19, 20, something like that. It didn't just go one way though. I had a colostomy bag and all that, but it got a little different. Yeah. Okay. Can you kind of take me through what happened when you got shot? Um, it was more of a thing of like a, a argument turned to a fight. The fight went down. The person couldn't handle the fight. I mean, it's all public record, so I'll be feeling uncomfortable talking about shit like this. But it's all public record, and it turned into a a, a shootout. Turned into a shootout. I got hit. Somebody else got hit. And, you know, the rest is history. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, you get you get shot and you go right to the hospital. How bad are you shot? I was, how many times did you get shot? I got I got hit once, but I didn't realize how how bad I was hit. And this was back when this was back when the police um would pick you up. Like if the ambulance wasn't there fast enough, they would pick you up and put you in a paddy wagon and take you there. So they took me there. So I didn't realize how bad I was hit until I got to the hospital. And I'm like throwing up. I'm like throwing up bad. Like I couldn't even see the blood like where I was leaking from. But I'm like throwing up bad. And then um, next thing you know, they put me to sleep. I woke up, I had a fucking colostomy bag on me. So I had the shit out of a bag for about a year. And um, one of my legs was messed up. And the doctor told me I wasn't really gonna never be able to use that leg again. I'm like, man, you crazy. And I just started dragging my leg around until it got like, you know what I'm saying, better. That shit just made me paranoid, so I started carrying guns after that. Wearing bulletproof vests, just carrying guns. It just got a little different. Damn. Um, yeah. Uh, how many surgeries did you have to go through? 
Uh, I had to actually go through two surgeries. The first surgery was uh, when I got shot, and then I had to go back to get another surgery, the reverse for the colostomy bag. And I was blessed to be able to not have to keep the colostomy bag. So I had to go back for that. And that was worse than getting shot. So at first you thought you were going to have to wear that for the rest of your life? Yeah, I did. I did. But because they said the bullet had shot, had shattered my bowel cord. So it wasn't definite that I was going to be able to get it reversed. You know what I'm saying? And I was blessed to be able to get it reversed. You know what I'm saying? So just imagine you walking around every day with a shit bag on and you just don't know if you're going to be able to get it reversed or not. Damn. Yeah. For a year. Damn, man. And you're in the middle of a war. You're still going through it with the actual situation. And the person that shot you is like, that's what he do. You know what I'm saying? That's what he, he's, he's that. So, and I'm young at the time. So I, you know what I'm saying? That turned me up to make me be a certain way because now I got to, I got to have my head on the swivel because it's active. We own it at that time. We talking years ago. We talking, man, we talking, we talking 90s. Like, we talking like 97, 96, something like that. Were you still in the streets even with the, the bag on you and everything? Yeah, I had to be. I still was hustling. Still was hustling, coming through. Anybody in my city that know me will tell you. Still was hustling, still was coming through. Back then I had the Audi 5000, go Audi 5000 with the crazy system in it. Running around the Cuban link chain going on. And, you know what I'm saying? Getting to it. Damn. Okay, and you said this, uh, you know, this changed you. It made you turn up? Yeah, it made me, that's what actually made me start rapping because I had caught like a, I started having like a bad temper. I think I used to be having like hot flashes all the time, I guess from when I got shot. So um, I never forget the first, the first encounter that I had when my bad temper was, when they had me in the hospital, like all my niggas was there. Like my mom was there, my pop was there. And the detectives came to the hospital. And when the detectives came to the hospital, they tried to talk to me. So I'm like, I don't wanna talk to them. You know what I'm saying? And they, so they pulling out mug shots and they got like all these mug shots this why I'm on a, I'm in a bed, like I'm I'm fucked up. I'm literally just waking up. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like from the surgery and all that. So they like, yo, did one of these guys shoot you? I'm like, man, get the fuck out of my get the fuck out of my room. And they like, yo, he's very disrespectful. And da, da, da. I'm like, fuck, I'm not telling y'all shit. You know what I'm saying? And that was my first notice of like my reaction, like after being shot. And I started to be like that all the time. So I never forget I went to go see my doctor. My doctor was like, you should find something to do to just, you know, curve your, your attitude because your attitude is shitty, it's, it's, it's fucked up. So I'm like, damn. So I start like writing stuff down that was bothering me. Then it just turned to me, start rapping. So I start, start writing verses. So that's how I started doing music. Did you ever worry about the guy coming back? Yeah, hell yeah, he was a shooter. You gotta understand, I was young at that time. You see what I'm saying? So I was in the streets, but I was more of a, a fighter at that time than I was playing with, with, with guns. But, you know, at that point, you gotta, you ain't got no choice but to step up and do what you gotta do. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I was, I had to be on it. It was, it was like that. He was a, he was a different type of guy. You know what I'm saying? He approached you at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. As time went on, like I said, this leg, my left leg was kind of bad. And um, what happened was I'm washing my car one day, but I knew what kind of car he drove, right? And I'm doing something to my tire and this car come up. And when the car came up, it was him. But the way my leg was, I couldn't get myself up in time. And my gun was inside the house. My, my window was right there. My cousin was staying with me at the time. and um. I'm like, damn, he got me. As soon as I seen the car, he like hopped out and he like, yo, I, I just want to holler at you. So I'm like, Phew. I'm like, damn, he already hit me once. You know what I'm saying? Then his little nigga got hit in the process of, of the shootout. So now I'm looking and I'm like, this shit ain't gonna go right. You know what I'm saying? And he gonna tag me and I, I can't run because my leg still up. But he like, no, this shit was all wrong. It was a miscommunication. 
you know what I'm saying, on their end, and it just got kind of, we, we kind of squashed it, which was kind of like the best thing to do at that time, at that period of my life at that time, because like I said, I, w I was active, but I was more of a fighter than I was playing with that. You know what I'm saying? And he was, he was polished at that time. Like that's what he do, and he was older than me. So it was a different thing then. Okay, and uh, I believe at one point, you know, you moved out of your house early? Yeah, I moved out of my house. I left home when I was 15. Never went back. Mm. How can you moved out so early? Because at the time, right, my little sister, uh, dad was there. We ain't really get along like that. Like, we're cool now, though, but we didn't really get along like that. You know, it's like going through that, you ain't my dad shit, and you know what I mean? So we just, I was sticking my chest out. So it's like, man, I'm out of here. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I was just on my own. Like, that's what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? I wanted to, I wanted to get money. You know what I mean? I was hanging around older people that was hustling. I wanted to get money. So I started living with my man who was older than me. You know what I'm saying? And I was just, I start, I started getting to getting to it. What was that like for you being out as at such a young age? You know, you're kind of on your own at that point. The first, I would say the first maybe couple months was rough. Shit, I was damn near homeless at first. Like, nowhere to go. Like, my family wasn't, like, we what I ain't had a family where we had all these houses and like I didn't I didn't have that. Like my family was small, you know what I'm saying? So for me, it's like I might stay over my man house this night. I might stay over my other man house this night. We, I, we used to play ball back in the day, so I play ball all day. And won't nobody know I might sleep on the bench that night. Come back. They think I'm coming back to play ball, but I never left. You know what I'm saying? And then I go to my grandma's house and wash up. You know what I mean? Put something on, they come back out. So the whole day would be, my whole day would be cool. But I'd be like, in my mind, while we playing ball, when it's getting dark, like, where well, I'm going to stay at tonight. That made me try to figure out I needed to hustle. So I started hustling weed. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I was just doing whatever I needed to do to survive. Were you rapping at this time? No, like, I knew how because you got to figure this was, this was like, it was like early. It was like early, you know what I'm saying? Like like real early for me. So, no, I wasn't, but I liked it, but I wasn't on it because I was just focused on trying to get some money. Okay, and you know, you move in with your friend and how does that work out when you guys are living there? My man, his mom had, he was older, so his mom had left him a house. I think she had moved to like Jersey or something. He used to cut my hair and he like, man, you can stay here. I'm like, all right, you know what I'm saying? So I, I would stay there. But we kind of had like a little fallout because I was selling like a lot of weed back then. But he used to be like, he, he had like a weed problem. Like that's why I never had no vices. He had like a weed problem. So he was going to my stash and shit like that. I'm like, oh no, I can't do this. You know what I'm saying? And then I, I, uh, I moved out, got my own apartment. You know what I'm saying? And I just started taking care of myself. Like never turned back. What's that like? You got your own apartment and you're, you're, you're young, you, you throwing parties? No, I wasn't really throwing parties. Like, I had my high school sweetheart with me at the town, so we had a spot together. You know what I'm saying? But it was just like normal. It was, I was more so happy that I had a roof. You know what I'm saying? That I could just sleep at night. I ain't got to get up and rush. I ain't got to jump up before nobody people's come in. I ain't got to do none of that. I could just relax. And I think I kind of got used to that and just being like I had to be older early you know because you gotta remember at the time when I left home I was 15 so started hustling you gotta figure I'm at like 17 now you gotta remember this prior before I get shot I didn't get shot yet I didn't get shot till I was about 18 night somewhere in there like between 18 and 20 is when I got shot so from 15 to then from 15 to now, I've been on my own. I haven't been back home. Okay, and I believe you said when you got shot is, is when you started rapping? Exactly. You know, who are some people you looked up to? Well, one of my best friends, he was uh, he was always rapping. So I used to always go to his house when I was like 10. 
Like I used to wear his sneakers and all that. Like go up on this. Like he used to have all the sneakers. I used to go up on this big and the sneakers. He had the turntables. We played with the turntables and all that. But he he wanted to rap, so I just I would mess with it, but I wasn't really messing with it like that. So it was just always like in me. So like I said, you know, when I got shot, that's when I start really, really like taking it seriously. That was my that was like my medication. You know what I'm saying? So I would write verses like I would listen to like Pop. I would listen to Scarface, G Rap. You know what I mean? I was just like, damn, like if they could talk about what they dealing with, I could talk about what I'm dealing with. So I would write my verses and just put whatever it is I was feeling like. And I would, I would just write them and I would say them on records. And we would go in the studio and record. Like, like my first studio sessions, like studio time back then was high as shit. So I would write two and three songs, and but now you gotta deliver it right. Cause you only got a couple hours. So I might get two songs down and then rush the last song. You know what I mean? And I was just always conditioned like that for a long time in the beginning. To always do three records in the studio, but the first two be right. The third one be off. That's the one you work on when you come back and book a new session, and then you do your new two after that song. You know what I'm saying? So I was always conditioned to do that. Okay. Uh, were you producing two at the time? Uh, I started messing with the MP when when I had got shot. I had the, when I had the closet bag. I figured my first probably, I would say my first. Three to four months, I was stuck in the house. Cause I couldn't really move that much like that with my leg, like, you know what I mean? And I knew I couldn't really be out there like that cause I was, it was a war, it was on. So I went and brought music equipment and that's when I started like working on it, making beats and shit like that. A lot of people don't know that I used to make beats. I don't even be saying nothing. <laughs> you slick with that one. You been, you been digging. Whatever? You been digging, you been, you been digging. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, we did some good homework, man. Yeah. Any wild prison stories you could share? <laughs> in the state, I yep. got into it with a guard before, but that was that was when I went back because I came home off the state joint, and then I ended up going back as a violator, and I was in Greatest for a Prison on E Block. Because when you are, when you a violator, you go to to E Block. Um, you don't go to just straight the population, because you might go back to your jail. You got to sit there a little bit. And it was this CO over there. And um, I was on the phone one day. He real loud, like, and he walked around the phone, like, yo, get, hang, hang the phone up, hang the phone up. I'm like, ending my call, but he like trying to make make us end our call faster. So he like, hang the phone up. I'm like, what the hell are you talking to? So now we start having words. So he like, all right, let's take it in the cell. But he telling me, they come, cause they got like a cell and greatest for on each block. They got like a cell, well greatest for is done now, but they had like cells that it's the office to sell. They might got tissue and all this in there, whatever, you know, supplies. They just make it like a, like a cell, it's a supply room. So like, you come on, you want some work? We can go in the cell. So I'm like, all right, come on, let's go. So the whole block, now mind you, the way greatest for blocks was, you might got about, I might be a little off, man. You might got about probably Three to four hundred people on one block on each side up and down. You know what I'm saying? This actually the jail that Wallow did 20 years in that I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I went in a cell with him. But they telling me the whole time I'm walking, I'm like, yo, don't go in a cell with him. Don't go in a cell with him. I'm like, man, f I'm tired. I'm going in a cell with him. So when I went in a cell with him, I'm thinking we about to rip. And I know he's going to hit the button on me, but I'm like, if they hit the button, all the police coming, at least I'm gonna I'm get him. So I go in there, we go in there, right? So he like, uh, of course I turn my back immediately, you know what I'm saying? So he went and swing on me first. As soon as he come in, he like, man, why you fronting on me in front of everybody? I'm like, no, man, you talking crazy. You ain't gotta talk like that. Like he didn't even wanna fight, but he didn't want them to see that he was really this way for real, for real. That wasn't the way he was. He's like, man, don't do that, man. Like, like, now they looking at me. and I'm like, yeah, but you could have just told me. You know what I mean? Hang up the phone. You ain't had to curse and all that. Like, I'm going to phone my peoples. So he's like, all right, we're going to leave this here, this, that, and the third. He like, but I got to write you up. I'm like, I don't give a fuck about no write-up. But I didn't know the write-up meant I was going to the hole. So he take me to my cell, double locked the cell. Everybody knew we ain't fight. He double locked my cell. 
with the write up, and then I had to go and see the um, I think the state, I think they call it DHO. Is it DHO they call it? Uh, the state? I think it's DHO. Anyway, I go see DHO. There was this old lady. I'm like, oh, all right, I'm gonna be cool. She gonna let me out. She gave me a hundred and twenty days in a hole. But I only had like probably 32 days left to max out. So she basically was saying, max out in the hole, you're not going back to the population. So I maxed out in the hole. But do you know, if I was to go back to state right now, I gotta do the rest of those days in the hole that stay on the shelf forever. You gotta finish that out first before you can go back to population. Yeah, they gotta get me in the state first. That ain't happening. No. Damn, so the CEO was just trying to act tough. Damn, yeah, he was just crazy. trying to act tough. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so you get out of jail and what do you do with yourself, man? Are you are you do you um, ever try to go straight? Do you ever try to get a job? No, nah, yeah, I tried that. I tried that. That shit ain't work though. I'm gonna tell you why. First, you know, when you get certain felonies, like when you get a felony period, they don't, nobody really wanna hire you. You know what I'm saying? And then any job that come, it'd be like under the table jobs. So I worked at like a moving storage company for probably about, I did that shit probably like 60 days, man. That shit, went, I was always moving too much shit. I couldn't do that. So I went back to hustling. I went back to the streets. I went back to what I know. Okay. And you're rapping at this point though. And are, are things picking up some for you? Oh, uh, let me see. Um. We had, I had to like a group situation with a team I was down with. And we did something with like Tommy Boy Records, but that shit ain't really work because they shelved that shit. You know what I mean? And it's crazy because the A&R from Tommy Boy Records at that time, it's my guy, it's my guy, his name Chris Atlas. And it's crazy how the world just spin around because when I left the situation, he told me he wanted to sign me as a solo artist. And uh, he was like, yo, just, you know what I mean? Just hold off, but I ain't hold off. I'm like, man, I'm going to the streets. I ain't got time for this rap shit. There's too much bullshit with it at that time. And um, he ended up going off to do great things. And he actually did a lot of things with uh with Ross and them. Yeah. Okay. And so this doesn't work out, yeah. but you keep going. At, you know, are you? do you have a buzz in the street at all yeah, at this my, point? Yeah, my, my buzz in the street was crazy. Like, uh, you got to figure I was on... Um, I start I start doing a lot of freestyles and shit on on a come up show with Cosmic Kev and Q D Z. It was like that was the thing in the city. Like if you was on a radio, if Cosmic Kev was playing your freestyle, bringing that shit back, shouting you out, and that shit, and you was hard, it was over. So it was like I had the streets. Like like they would f me hard, and I'm talking about at a time you gotta understand. And I tell people this all the time. I was dropping freestyles and getting motion at the time when Beanie Siegel and Major Figures was out. State property didn't come yet. They was on their way though. I'm talking about when it was Beanie Siegel, Gilly and, and, and Spade and all of them. And when they was like, they was going crazy like on everything. They was doing the dead man walk in on flax and you know, they was doing a lot of shit. I'm coming, I'm in pocket. I ain't had no team, it was just me. It was just me just coming from the streets. It was just me just coming with this voice. And I kept hitting and kept hitting them. And then, you know, I started doing joints with them. You know what I'm saying? And we just, I just was smashing all over the radio. Like nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. Every freestyle, every record. I knew how to make records. So I was always just in that, I was always in that pocket. I was always in that list. They couldn't deny me. Even if you ain't like me, you ain't had no choice but to say, man, that nigga be all over the radio, though, bro. He always coming with some shit every time. Were you meeting anybody or 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 getting noticed by anybody at this point? Um, At that point, I would say, like, I was still in the streets hard. I was, I was, I didn't know what I was doing. All I knew was just, like, all I, all I had at that time was Cosmic Kev. You know what I'm saying? And I would take him shit and he'd be like, Yo, this too long. Or yo, why you ain't do this? Or yo, why you ain't do that? And I would take it back and critique it. So still to this day, when I go and I make records, I think about shit that he taught me. You know, just 
you know, because the DJ know, the DJ know how a record is, you know what I'm saying, it's supposed to be. So, you know, at that time, I kind of like, he all I had at that time. And we used to go at it. I'm talking about like, we used to argue, yell at each other, damn, they about to fight, like all kinds of shit. This used to be crazy. But I was just passionate about what I was trying to do. And we knew each other for a long time. You know what I'm saying? And his uh, his brother, rest in peace to, to Kenny Lee, that was my man too. You know what I'm saying? So it was a different relationship. So I ain't going to say me and him had a hate-love relationship. I wouldn't say hate and love because it's, it sound weird. We just had a, a – it, it was a real friendship. You know, friends go through shit. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? He just wouldn't play shit just because we was cool. It had to be hot. How'd you guys meet? We met through somebody. And when we met, we was about to fight. And I think he just kind of liked it. Me, like, I'm going to see what he about. You know what I'm saying? And then he just started start liking me and shit. You know what I'm saying? When he was going to the radio stations, I would go with him. You know what I'm saying? And sit there while he doing his sets. A lot of people don't know this shit. Like, I used to sit there when he first was doing his hours and hours and a half, and I would sit there. Or sometimes I would go down and hear him and um, Kobe Cole and watch him, you know what I mean? And watch him and QDJ just do the show. You know what I mean? Like, I was there when, uh, it's funny because when Beanie, like when Beans got, got his deal, I was there the first day he rapped. You know what I'm saying? And when, it, when I heard him rap, I'm in the other room with Cosmic Kev, because I was supposed to do an interview that day. And he was like, yo, I need you to do me a favor. Like, he's like, yo, I need you to, uh, let me push your interview back the next week because I got this kid from South Philly that's got signed to Rockefeller. At the time, he was he was Beanie Mac. He like, he coming up to spit. Now, mind you, I wasn't one of those guys that would rap for hours or spit all these verses. I wasn't doing that shit. You know what I mean? Like, I ain't taking that from nobody else, but I was two in the streets for that shit. I ain't got time to be saying right no more thousand bars. I'm not doing that shit. I'm going to give you 16 and you can get the out of here. So he came up. I said, all right, cool. I said, I want to see him. Cause nobody knew what he looked like. So I'm like, all right, bet. He like, come up. I come up and sitting in the DJ room with him, but they, in, they on the other side. That nigga started rapping. I was like, man, I'm done with this rap shit. He got it. That nigga started rapping over that DMX beat. He just wouldn't stop. That nigga rap for like two hours straight. Like I ain't never seen no shit like that before in my life. I said, I'm done with this shit. I'm, I'm done. It's over. I ain't even want to do it no more after that. But then I started, you know what I'm saying, doing my thing. But yeah, that was an eye opener for me when he came. Damn, and you met Beanie Siegel that day? No, we didn't meet that day. I just watched him from the other side. It's crazy because we talk about that story. When I told him that story, he's like, damn, for real? I'm like, yeah, I was right there. You know, I was right there in the other room. You know what I mean? This is when he was Beanie Mac. He wasn't even Beanie Siegel yet. Damn, yeah. okay. and. And so, but you do continue to still, yeah. you know, rap and does it, does it motivate you at one point? Um, I think, I think what motivated me was what I was dealing with, what I was going through, everything that I was dealing with in the streets and my life is what motivated me the most. You know what I'm saying? More, more than anything. I think when Jay-Z came with Streets is Watching and all that shit, you know, a lot of us felt like that was our life. That's what we was going through, what we was dealing with. No matter what level of money it was you was getting, if you was a hustler, you was a hustler. So I think, you know, that that shit opened up the doors. That opened up the lights. And then to see, like, Beanie Siegel get a deal. Gilly, Gilly the Kid get deals. Uh, Dutch and Spade get a deal. Like, that shit opened up, you know, my eyes a little bit more to the industry. Like, shit, if they could do it, I could do it too. These are the niggas that I know. You know what I mean? These is... This is, they, they the same age as, as me. They running around just like me. So, you know, that opened my eyes a lot. At one point, you, I believe, meet Tony Yayo or, yeah. or 50 Cent? Yeah, so what happened was um, a really good friend of mine uh, named Big Champ, uh, we started running around real, real strong. And he was cool with an old head named Steve Brody. So, because he asked me, like, yo, who you want? Well, I'm like, man, I want that 50, man. The realest in this shit. And at the time, 50 had all kind of beef and shit going on. I'm like, man, that, I felt like 
I feel like I was that nigga. I feel like a lot of niggas ain't like me, but a lot of niggas didn't play with me. You know what I'm saying? But um, so we went to Brody, and he was like, oh, I'll have to introduce you to him. And, I, and the anger management tour was coming to Philly. And uh, he took me and introduced me to him. And um, then from there, we went to his house the next day. He had a big party for uh, Get Rich or Die Trying. The movie was coming out. And that's when I like met everybody. Like, I'm talking about, like, I'm, I'm looking like, damn, we in Mike Tyson house. Like, this shit is crazy. Like, I thought I would never see no shit like this. And we went up there deep. Like, 50 so much of a real nigga, we went to his house in Connecticut and at least, no exaggeration, about 10 forms, 10 machines, four people in each car. Everybody got into the party. You know what I'm saying? They like, yo, uh, Steve Brody and Mike Knox and them had the gate. They like, he like, let them in. They like, they got a lot of cards with him. He like, how many? Ten. He like, man, let them in. So it's like, when we got there, that's when like Lil John and all of them was on the tour. And you know, it was a lot of people on the tour. They was all there. Like, I'm talking about everybody was at this party. Every, anybody that was somebody was at this party. You know what I mean? And he was like, yo, we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. But then that shit started happening with him in the game. You know what I'm saying? Like they start going at it. So it was like to be a new nigga trying to come into something when some shit like that going on, it just wasn't, it wasn't the, the perfect timing, but you know what I mean? And um, then we had a show. We had a show in Philly where, where we booked Tony Yayo. So we booked Tony Yayo. So this is what I did. I'm like, damn, I got to show these niggas who I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, so they came. So I booked, no exaggeration. I put this on, I put this on everything I love. I booked every room on the same floor he was on in the hotel. He'll tell you this. I booked every room, right? I had all this weed. And this is the craziest story that's going to f you up. So we meet. He come to my room. He like, damn, you got all these niggas around. So he wanted some weed, like, yo, I want some weed. I said, we got weed. So I said, I said, my man got weed. I, I, I'm not gonna say my young boy because I don't look at him as my young boy because he my man, but it, it just, they just was younger than me. But you know what I mean? They was coming around at the time, like we with each other hard. So I'm like, my man got weed. He like, who? I'm like, right here. I pointed to him, he was on the game. It was Meek Mills. Meek Mills had the weed at the time. He was, he was selling dro like Hayes and Dro. So he like, damn, you got the weed? He like, yeah, you know, I'm a Meek Mills or whatever. I had Meek Mills and Joey Jahad in my, in my hotel room at that time. You know what I'm saying? So Meek gave him the weed. Like, Meek was so thorough. Then I had the uh, Mike Knox game over G on the T-shirts on. He had one on. Joey Jahad had one on. And I literally had a hundred niggas with like, I'm... No exaggeration. If I'm lying, yeah, yeah, we'll tell you I'm lying. I had a hundred niggas with me. We went to the show. Yeah, he was like, yo, I'm gonna come out right after you go on. He's like, I'm right here. I'm watching the show and everything. He watched the show. Then he came out. He like, yo, you gotta come out on stage with me. And then something happened in the midst of the crowd. Well, I think somebody tried to say something slick to Yay or something like I don't, I don't know what it was. But we all jumped in the crowd. You know what I'm saying? And it got a little crazy for a minute. But then it got it got it got fixed real fast. So after the show, we leaving. This one I knew he was a real nigga. They pulled off. Boom. Now mind you, like I said, I got a hundred niggas with me. When he left, he bust a U-turn and came back and got out his bulletproof truck, like, yo, you good? I said, bro, I'm good. I'm in my city. I'm good. He like, I'll make sure, I just wanted to make sure you good, my nigga. That's when I knew he was a real nigga. You know what I'm saying? Because any other niggas, they got their money, they perform, they gonna get in their shit and get the out of here and roll. So, so mind you, I forgot when we was in the hotel after we did everything, he hosted a mixtape for me. He like, yo, I'm gonna host your mixtape. I'm like, all right, bet. Like, how you wanna do it? He like, your man got the camera, right? I'm like, yeah. He like, all right, I'm gonna do it right now. He like, y'all can just take the audio from the video. He did the mixtape. He, he did all these drops from my mixtape. My engineer at the time 
took the audio, put it together, and we was able to put it out. Took a picture with me for the cover. He did he did all that. You know what I'm saying? He took took a whole picture. He did all that. So um, then after that, what happened after that? Oh, he told he told Fifty about me. He was like, "Yo, Fifth, that's this nigga in Philly named Mike Knox, man. That nigga kind of serious, bro. That nigga had a hundred niggas with me when we was out there." He like what? He like, oh, he's talking about the, 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 the nigga that Brody brought. He like, yeah, yeah, that nigga. He like, bro, that nigga. So now I had a, I had a, <laughs> I had a meeting. This how off I was at the time. I had a meeting at, uh, at G Unit. And I came up there. I thought that was the way I was supposed to be. First time I came up there, I had like 50 niggas with me, <laughs> like coming to the office. It's like, you can't let all these niggas come with you. Like, what you doing? And um, then I finally had the meeting with Shy Money. I had because they kept hearing so much about me. They kept hearing so much about me, and it was like, let's figure out what we doing. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, the shit was going on with game, and um, that was that was that was kind of like a little thing at that time. He was focusing on that, and um, and then and then I had a meeting with Shy Money. And I played music for him and all that shit. And he was like, yo, I'ma um I'm gonna let Fifth know what's up. Like, like we gon' we gon' we gonna figure something out. And at the time, uh it was between me and the uh hot rod. And uh Shaw Money was working with Hot Rod. You know what I'm saying? No disrespect to Shaw Money and nothing like that. But the difference was Shy Money was working with Hot Rod. I think Hot Rod was from Arizona. Now that I know, you know, years later, Hot Rod was from Arizona and Shy Money was living out of Arizona. So I think he was like working with Hot Rod. You know what I'm saying? He liked me too, but you know, his his investment was his, he was investing in Hot Rod or whatever. So and I guess that's who Fifth liked at the time. So he went with Hot Rod. You know what I'm saying? And I kind of like just sat back. And just still didn't give up and was making my way. You know what I'm saying? Just grinding it out. You mentioned Meek Mill. So yeah. so you knew Meek Mill even way back then? Hell yeah, me and Meek Mill from the same hood. From North Philly. Yeah. Do you remember how you guys met? Um You know what's crazy? I don't remember the first exact day we met. Um I want to say it might have been through Oskino because Oskino and Jihad was cool. And we used to take Jihad around to battle people. So I think we, I think it was like kind of one of them days where Meek and Jihad was together. Cause Meek and Jihad used to kick it together back then when they was young. So I think it was one of them, like, it might've been like that. Like, and then I recognized like, damn Meek, you live right around, the, not, too, not too far from, you know, where I'm at. Cause I lived on 16th and um, and Cecil B. Moore. It used to be 16th in Columbia, but 16th and Cecil B. Moore. And he was from Burks, Burke Street. You know what I'm saying? So that's like literally, you know what I mean? So it was just like we just matched. We he was always like cool. He was never like, you know, no bullshit. We was always cool. You know what I'm saying? Was he rapping at the time? Yeah, he was rapping. He was rapping his ass off. At, at um, he was down with headshots at the time, and I remember he had went to jail. I think he had went to jail for that case. If that, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the case where he was on probation for a long time, where he got the cops beat him up and all that shit with the gun and all that dumb shit. And um, I think his bell was for like 10,000 or something. I think niggas couldn't, niggas could, they probably couldn't get him out or something like that. But um, when he did get out, he parted ways from them. But I had a studio on Delaware Avenue, right? Like the Sugar House is there now, a casino, but my studio was across the street from there. Uh, and they used to, my old head, me and him partnered up with it, you know, after he kind of fell back. And they used to come down, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Joey Jahad, Quilly, Meek, A.R. Ab, they all came. And the first song that Meek and A.R. Ab did was, was really with me over a freestyle off my Philadelphia mixtape. And um, you know, I was cool with all of them. Like we we was all cool. But he was rap though, he was rapping like that then, like rapping over beats for hours and all that shit. He was doing that shit then. 
He always was going to be. He just needed a shot. He was doing it then. Damn. Yeah. You got any any memories or stories you could share from from back then with him? Um. Yeah, I I, I remember he when he start getting his look. Like I said, you, matter of fact, Meek was locked up. When Meek was locked up, um, he was locked up with somebody else that I knew. And um, that person was down for a temp. And uh, I think they were sellies or something like that. And Meek called me like, yo, he went he went to court, man, but he ain't, he ain't never come back to the he ain't never come back to the jail tonight. I said, I know he out here with us. He like, what? What the but Meek had a detainer, and I remember he was like, yo, tell Kev, play my shit for me, man. And um, he didn't have, he had like a lot of freestyles and all that shit then. And um, then he came home and he just, he started tearing shit up. Booking his own studio time. You know, it'd be him, it should be all of us in the Batcave studio. It'd be me, Meek, Gil, O'Malley, Black De Niro, uh, that eight gang, like it, it like a, just be a, a, a Garcia, Ready Rock. It just be a bunch of us in there. You know what I'm saying? Just, just knocking out records. Like he'll be doing a session, and he only care niggas is in there. We all, we all would be doing sessions, but we all would just be in each other's session. You know what I mean? And everybody was from all over, whether niggas are strapped or whatever. We all f- with each other. You know what I mean? Live joke, kicked it. Like, and we did that shit for years, and a lot of people don't know, a lot of songs and freestyles that Cosmic Kev was playing came from us being in the back cave, just, just kicking it, not even planning it. Like, yo, what beat you working on? Y'all working on this. You got a verse for it? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just would be like that. Me could be like, yo, you got something for this? Yeah. And that's just like how, like, a lot of freestyles and records got done. I remember at one point, you know, there was like gonna be a G unit Philly. Yeah. So so what had happened was Fifth had liked it a lot of artists in Philly. Cause you know, like we was the like the um we was on World Star and you know, YouTube was blowing up, so you had a lot of rappers on YouTube rapping and freestyling and being on all the DVDs. So he was like, yo, I wanna I wanna do something. You know what I'm saying? So um I was like, get artists together, you know what I'm saying? And he's like, yo, start your own thing out there. Yeah, it was like, yo, start your own thing out there. You know what I'm saying? Grab these niggas and, and, and make something happen. And I'm like, all right. Um, and I like took people, I took people to fifth. I took uh, Reed Dowers to 50. I took, uh, shit, Cheat Raw to 50. And um, then I ended up just putting my own thing together where it was like me, Tone Trump, I Vegas, and Cotty. You know what I mean? I had the studio, so I was able to, I was invested into a studio with a, 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 a OG of mine that, that believed in me. You know what I'm saying? So I was able to do whatever I wanted 24 hours. So all we did was rec- record music. And um, we did a mixtape. And um, when we did the mixtape, we, we we put some heat together. We just we just was pushing, you know what I'm saying. But eventually, some things fell off. I got booked. Um, but in the process of that, even before that, and after that, I think kind of like the media shit was kind of too much for certain people. You know what I'm saying? Because if you look at G and the G and it always had got some type of backlash, whether it was good or bad. You know what I mean? You got to be really built for this shit to really understand it. You know what I'm saying? And um, I think some people just didn't understand it. You know what I mean? Niggas was younger than them, though. So, you know, being older, I'm pretty sure they understand, like, damn, Knox really was looking out for niggas. You know what I'm saying? Like, trying to give niggas a, a, a chance, an opportunity or whatever. You know what I mean? And, uh, like, even, like, with Tone Trump, like, I used to always be on him because I always looked at him like, yo, bro, you, you're getting the right attention, but you're going the wrong direction. Why the f*** is you on the internet with two guns sitting on your lap. Do you know they could zero in and get these serial numbers and charge you if these guns come back stolen? And he would think that I'm trying to taint his image, but I'm really just telling you, don't go that way. You know what I'm saying? Like, look at what Boosie going through right now. And I was telling him not to do this shit back then. You know what I'm saying? So, and me and him have conversations, you know, here and there where he's like, damn, big homie, 
damn, bro, you was really being big, bro. I really understand now. Like, I didn't understand, and I felt like you was just trying to stop me from doing what I wanted to do, but you really was trying to show me the way. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's a different thing now. He's doing his thing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Do you ever go on tour with G-Unit? Yeah. Um, when I came home from my fat bit, I went on tour with 50. We was going for, like, shit, maybe right before COVID. We was going for probably, like, two, three months. Every day on the jet for like two, three months, going everywhere. So yeah, I definitely did that. What was that like? Do you have any wild stories from being on tour with it, with Fifty and everybody? It was unbelievable. Put it that way. It was very rich, comfortable. Everything's everything is five star, nothing less. I'm talking about from the towels to the food to the hotels. Nigga, they, I had a hotel room so big, I went back downstairs and gave him the key, thinking they gave me the gave me his room. I thought it was his room. Like, yo, I think y'all gave me the wrong key. And they like, no, that's your room. And I'm like, damn, these, this my room? My room looked like a mansion. Like, literally, like, this shit was crazy. And then it's like, you're doing a show, you're doing an in-store, then you hopping on the jet and you going to another state. Then you hopping on the jet, going to another state. You hopping on the jet, going to another state. Then you in the car, then you here, then you on the jet, then you on the, shit was, you hopping off a jet to get on another jet. This shit was crazy. You understand, I'm fresh out the feds and this shit is happening. I'm like, what the f Okay. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Is there any wild times that happen? As far as what? Like uh, any fights or anything on tour? Somebody always get punched on. You know how that shit go. There's always somebody <laughs> that put themselves in a bad space. But not, not, not. I mean, not really, because we don't be looking for no trouble. We just be trying to do what we got to do and get out of there. We never the ones to start no trouble. And like, niggas don't be wearing lawsuits and all that shit. Don't nobody got time for that shit. Niggas on grown man time. You know, now you're with G-Unit and everything, man. Mm -hmm. And you'd mentioned the whole game situation, man. I, I think you put out a song, Dissing Game and Young Buck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, at that moment, it was like, whatever they got to do to get on. If we got to go head up, that's what, that's what we got to do. You know what I'm saying? Did you ever meet Game and Young Buck before yeah, the song Buck. or anything? Yeah I, yeah, I met Buck before. The Buck came late though. But yeah, I I yeah, I met Buck. Like Buck was to me, Buck was a cool Like Buck is I, I I still don't understand some things, but who am I to speak on it? You know what I'm saying? Like that shit is bigger than me with them. But Buck was a cool nigga. I used to talk to Buck when I was locked up. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like Buck used to like FaceTime me and all that shit. Like, I mean, I could talk about it now because I ain't in no more, but you know, before all this other shit started going on with Buck, like Buck used to pick up the phone. All of them used to pick up the phone for me. Buck, Yay, Fifth, they always picking up the phone for me. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I met, I met them niggas. Now, when you get on though, but his biggest issue is with Ja Rule. Yeah. Do you ever run into Ja Rule or have any incidents over, over his beef with Ja Rule? No, because you would have heard about it. No. Like, my loyalty a little bit wired different. You know what I'm saying? So, no. No. Mm -mm. Now, at some point, you guys end up at the BET Awards in 2012. Right. Can you kind of take me through that whole night and situation? As I remember it uh, vividly, we was there for, how about this? I, 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 do, I do you one better. I remember being in the G unit office, right? And the show CD came over for the BET Awards. And that's when they asked Fifth if he would do it. You know, um, rest in peace to Chris Lighty. They had set up a, a tribute for Chris Lighty. 
And I think people in the office at the time were a little nervous about um, if Fifth would 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 do it because of who were on like the lineup of the actual, uh, you know, the thing with Chris. Fat Lane. Joe, right? Yeah. Fat so, Joe was part of it. So uh, Fat Joe was on there. So I never forget it. We sitting there listening to the show lineup. They actually had, um, I think, Flex. I think Flex set the, set the music up, if I'm correct. And we listening. And they just waited for Joe's part to come. And they looked at the response to see how he would respond to it. And he was like, oh, okay. Because it was for Chris Lighty. So none of that shit mattered anymore at that moment. You know, when, when Chris passed. Um, it's crazy because I was blessed to be around him, like, which was a blessing. You know what I mean? Uh, I remember being in 50 Bulletproof truck, me, 50, and Chris Lighty together. And we drove to Alicia Keys' studio for a meeting with, um, with Alicia Keys and Swiss. And, um, you know, Chris was a good guy. He was about his business. And I learned a lot just being around him the times that I was around him. You know, he used to have this thing where he used to say, like, uh, at shows, he about politics walking through. That means he coming through with some serious people, move out the way. They going to see 50. But um, so to get back to the BET Awards, so once he heard the setup, it was a go that we was doing it. You know what I mean? So we got out there. We had to go for rehearsal. Actually... I had um, missed the first part of the actual rehearsal when they was going, you know, to see him. When he first, first seen Joe, I had missed that part. I got there after that. So I was already told that, you know, him and Joe, like they they spoke on stage because they had to do a pre-run before the actual show. The weird thing about the BET Hip Hop Awards that year was this. I don't know who was in charge. I don't know who set things up, but all of the trailers were set up. It was set up for mass destruction. You had Fat Joe's trailer here. You had Diddy trailer here. You had T.I. trailer here. 50 Cent trailer. Meek Mill's trailer. Two Chains trailer, Rick Ross trailer, and then I think French Montana trailer. So you had all of these people trailers like this around each other, and this shit is going on right now. So, but at that moment, um, everything with Joe was was off. You know, like Eve Rivera was was fifth guy who was Fat Joe's guy. You know, and well, Eve is like a brother to me. He did my video uh, back block, my first major video when I came home. He showed me so much love and got it sent to so many different places for me. Um, and, you know, Eve has done, uh, I think, BMF, Power, all these different things, and uh, Bobby Brown Special, all these different things. So anyway, you know, just, just making sure I plug my guys right. But so everything was cool at that moment. When it was time for us to walk to the stage, before it was time for us to walk to the stage, I guess Gunplay had arrived. The space that we was in, you could still see the front. Fifth was doing an interview inside his trailer. Uh, all of us was outside of the trailer talking, kicking it. You know, we spotted him, we seen him. So important people, when I say the people, like this is why I say when he tells this story, He's the only thing I think he didn't know was that it was squashed at that moment with Joe. It was over. Um, he didn't want to. He wanted to come in the back. They telling him to go another way. I don't know if because he felt like why am I going another way or no I'm going in the back. This is where I was told to come or whatever case may be. Ross and I had already went inside. The shit had already happened with Ross and Jeezy. I don't care about that shit. That ain't my business. But 
Um, now, mind you, prior to that, we had already seen Meek. Meek is my man. We took pictures, all that shit. Boom. Meek and them went in. Gunplay still standing back there. Now, you got executives that's telling him to go another way. You got people from Interscope telling him to go another way. He's being told this multiple times to go another way. And he realizes in the process of being told that, that he see us back there. I think he's seen Yayo or he said, whoever he's seen, he knew like we was back there. So now he's really like, oh, that's why he tell me, oh, I know. So he want to be seen now. So what he did was, we got to walk because the timing of the show, they're performing. You know, it was Missy, Buster, um, Joe. I forgot who else was on there. But it, we got to get to the actual inside and to the stage in order for Fifth to be on the side of the stage before it's time for him to actually go on and do his part. Because nobody even knew he was there. They didn't expect it. This is a moment in hip-hop. This is a moment for Chris Lighty, one of the biggest legendary managers in the game that's no longer with us. This is a moment. So it's not about no violence. It's not about no bullshit. Everything is it's cool, calm. So we like that. We walking. Come on, let's go. We got to get to where we got to go. We walking. Fifth's not paying it no mind at all. He's not even thinking about none of that shit. I don't know what he's thinking about. He's not thinking about that at all. He's never... He never shows any type of emotion or anything where it's an issue. So when we get to the steps, the steps are so small, right, that gunplay times itself walking because there's so many of us, only two people could walk like this at the same time. So he makes it to where as though he kind of meets Fifth. I don't know if he thought he was going to swing on him I don't know if he thought he was, whatever he thought he was about to do. And the homie looked at him and said to him, you know you're not supposed to be here right now. And then he got punched in his mouth. And after he got punched, he got his ass beat from the steps down to the ground. And all I remember was we were him up because it's like you always in complete violation number one we here for Chris Lighty we're not even here for this shit nobody not on nothing Rick Ross even walked through prior to that and wasn't on that type of time you know what I'm saying but you making it an issue where we just moving in peace and trying to do what we got to do but nobody's going to play with you because you you out of bounds. You court, you out of bounds. And you've been talking all this crazy shit on the internet anyway. And now you got to be the man that you say you are. So he got his ass beat. That's it. In the process of the fight kicking off, I'm the biggest one. So by me being the biggest one, they starts pepper spraying. So when they pepper spray, and the midst of them pepper spraying me, I'm already all over them. You know what I'm saying? So when they start to the pepper spray, everybody's like spreading out, but the pepper spray hit me big. So when the pepper, I don't, I don't know what type of pepper spray this shit was, but it hit me. So when it hit me, I falls. Like, damn, boom. So now I'm trying to get up. So I'm feeling somebody hit me in my back. They not punching me in my face. No, none of this shit. I'm getting hit in my back because I'm falling trying to get up. The only reason why I'm not swinging back is because I think it's the police. I'm thinking the police is trying to, you know, contain me because I keep getting up. So I'm thinking they're trying to contain me to cuff me because we beating his ass in front of them. So if you beating somebody's ass in front of the police, what are they going to do? Arrest you, right? So I'm like this, but I can't see. I'm just keep feeling this in my back. I'm never get. if you look at the video, I never got hit in my face, not one time, right? So now, the cop, I just hear the cop like, get up, get up, get up, because I guess they sprayed, they sprayed us again. So when they spraying him, they spraying me again. This is when you see him like dart off. And then, they, then I'm getting up, you know what I'm saying? 
but they let me through and I went in and we did the show. I was uh, waiting to get out and the police won't let me out. And I had a thing behind me. I could either jump that and, and run into the darkness like a coward or we could just run it right here. So uh, Mike Knox, I think that's his name, big guy. He threw a punch. I threw a punch. Uh, then. So, so from the video, you know, they, they all kind of jump on you. Yeah. You know, and then, and then it gets broken up. Yeah. Then it get broken up the, and, and the then pepper spray broke everybody up and but, then it but was my But before that turn. happens, you go after somebody. Yeah. Then I, then I jumped on one of them. Uh, I think it was Mike Knox again. But prior to that, I grabbed his chain off his neck. I swung him like a rag doll and took his chain off his neck. Now, my thing is this. This shit happened 10 years ago. Not 10 months ago, 10 years ago. Why are you still talking about this shit? Because this is what's going to happen. This is, how, this is how bullshit start trickling up. Just as well as he got niggas, I got niggas too. My phone ring too. I know people in different places too. You understand what I'm saying? So now you making a situation that's not a situation anymore. I get it. You feel away. You got your ass beat. All right, you want to fight? We can fight. You want to get in the ring? We get in the ring. What you calling Yayo? What you calling Yayo out for? Anyway, I asked the uh, celebrity box Tony Yayo the other day. Anyway. <laughs> So you you want to box Tony Yayo and some celebrity boxers? Yeah, I'll celebrity boxers. box Tony Yayo. Cause cause he was definitely there. Cause you can yeah, hear Tony he was, Yayo. But he ain't do nothing. All you heard was him saying, "Yeah, nigga, yeah, nigga, yeah, yeah, nigga, yeah, nigga." <laughs> Why you calling him? Don't call him out. Call me out. Get in the ring with me. And then I feel away because you keep getting on these drinks, talking about what you would have did and what you would have did to Mike Knox and. All it, I don't. I be taking it light on this situation because I don't really care about it, and I'm really like a different type of dude. Like, meaning like, this internet. People watch this shit. People kids watch this shit. So I don't be saying certain shit because I'm just a different type of individual. But what I will say is anything I I I, I want to say, I'll say it to your face instead of saying it on the internet. It's been ten years. It's ten years. And you still talking about this ass whooping that nobody gives a fuck about. Like nobody cares about this ass whooping. And you sitting here saying, if you had a knife, what you would have did to me, or I would stab him in his armpits if I had a knife. No, you wouldn't have, because if you would have did that, you wouldn't be here today to talk about it. Then I jumped on one of them. Uh, I think it was Mike Knox again. And uh, I wish I had my shank on me. <laughs> then I would have, I was already going out with a bang. And I said, nah, don't take the shank, dog. Don't add no extra charges, dog. If you, but if I would have brought that, I would have jabbed him right in his armpit right there. Da, 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 da. Nah, let me take, take that back because they gonna persecute me again, dogs. <laughs> Good place says you gonna stab Mike Knox. Nah, nah. <laughs> but, um, nah, I just, you know, just try to get some get back. Way in the world you would have did something like that to me and think you're gonna be here to talk about it. And that's just what it is. We're just gonna be real with what this shit is. Everybody keeps saying what they will do, what they about, what they this. There's no videos of me being knocked out all over the internet. There's I don't have he got he gets knocked out on a normal basis. This is what he gets into. He gets drunk and gets up. I don't do drugs. I don't come from none of that. You understand what I'm saying? So my thing is, let that shit go because it's going to get ugly for no reason because you keep bringing up shit from the past and you kicking up dust. And at the end of the day, if you feel away and you want to get the shit off your chest, let's get in the ring and get, off, get it off our chest. I know he couldn't stand two rounds with me. Anybody want to put the money up and feel like they want to bet on that shit, I knock that nigga out in a round or the second round, guaranteed. I'll rumble the nigga. I don't have no problem... We're getting in the ring and beating him the up by myself. That's a fact. That's that's what I do. 
So if he wants to do that, we could do that. But all this keep getting on people, blogs, and trying to make a press run. Like, this is what he did the first time. See, the first time, people don't realize. As soon as after this shit happened, the next day, this nigga was on the Breakfast Club on the radio. No, I'm lying. This nigga was on TMZ. Lying. Saying he didn't get jumped. Lying. Saying he, oh, and the scar was on my face. Nigga, you didn't show your face until weeks later. You know you was fucked up. You know what I'm saying? So now my thing is like, you try to make this a press run, and now you bring it up again. When you need to be talking about how you're not happy with your homeboy. How your homeboy ain't really doing shit for you. Like you just got, you just had a post where you give a nigga a chain while he landing in the bed trying to sleep. Looking like he ain't even had you on the schedule to see you that day. But you getting on these blogs and you keep talking about what you would have done that day. Let's be for real, man. It happened the way it happened. You was out of bounds. You was out of pocket. You was dead wrong. I leave it at that. That's it. That's all. Because you ain't going to do shit. What happened to his chain? I don't know. That shit lost and found somewhere. Nobody want that shit. It popped up in a music video one time. I was in the feds by then. See, oh. people don't know that day that I was on a surrender time for 30 days. I was about to go in and start my sentence. I had a seven-year bid to do. So that's why I didn't really care about, about that shit. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, I didn't really care about it. I wasn't I didn't even zero zero in on it. Like, I went to jail so fast right after that that I was watch. I was looking at this shit in magazines, seeing what he was saying and all this shit. I'm like, why this nigga saying my name? All you had to do was go the other way. Okay, and so after you guys do that, you guys go do the uh, Chris Lighty right. uh, dedication yeah. on stage, man. And uh, how was that? Um. It was crazy because when we got to the backstage, they act like they didn't want to let Pistol Pete in them in. And Fifth was like, yo, G, you and the terror squad, they got to come in. I'm not going in until they go in. And, you know, they let them in. And we all spoke, went in. Fifth did the show. And then we left. Uh, so they were hesitant to put terror squad and G unit there at the same time? Well, when we was going in, because you got to remember, the fights is breaking out. The shit just happened with Ross and Jeezy. Then the shit happened with us. They didn't even want to let us go in when Fifth was about to perform. But, you know, we not we not, not going in after this shit then kicked off. You know what I'm saying? So they was trying to stop Ye, me, every, they was trying to stop all of us from going in. But they couldn't. So And it's crazy because the the, the show was rolling while this was happening. So... We still was able to make it in and get it done. And like I said, after that, that's when he just went on this like, because my whole thing was, damn, we just got in a fight at the BET Award. This shit gonna be all on the camera. They might call, you know, my, my lawyer might call and say, yo, you gotta go in early. I didn't want that. So I'm not saying nothing. I'm not doing no interviews. I'm, I'm denying I was even there. I ain't even saying I was there. But he going on at TMZ and then he calls in the Breakfast Club. He just trying to do like a whole promo run. Thinking somebody want to talk about this shit. We think he going to lead this shit in the street. He took it to the, he took it to the radio. I mean, it's something else. So I just followed up because what happened was the first video that came out was me down on the ground, pepper spray, and him hit me in my back. So in his mind, he thinking, oh, it ain't no other video. Yeah, I could say this, that, and the third, right? So he kept saying, yeah, I caught one of them. That was his first interviews. I caught one of them niggas, the fat one, and this and that, da, 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 da. And then, like, probably a day or two later, the real video came out. Somebody had it. That's when people start with their phones. And that shit hit Worldstar, and everything changed from there. Then I start getting the calls and all this shit. You know what I mean? It's crazy. You know, at one point, 50 and Rick Ross start to have issues. And... Uh, uh, I think Ross did... I think Ross diss fifth or something like that on a... Ross diss fifth on a... 
on a record or something like that. It wasn't nothing that they, it wasn't nothing like a, you know, like. I think it was something minor. And then I just remember yeah. all these cartoons started coming out about Rick Ross on This Is 50. I really feel like, honestly, I feel like, it, it, I really feel like Ross did that just trying to level himself up. Like, there was, there was a point in time that, I ain't going to say a point in time, but I, I, there was a point in time that if you diss 50 Cent, right, two things is going to happen. One, it's not going to go well for you. Two, your name going to be in the headlines next to his. So I, at that time, his name was right next to fifth every time, you know, with the beef thing, with the beef thing, with the beef thing. You know what I mean? And I think it was just like, what? So, you know, that's when they, you know, start going at it. Because, you know, Fifth ain't ducking no wreck with nobody. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think the the ones that they should be concerned about is the ones when he don't say nothing back to him. You know what I mean? That's when they get a little, a little different. But it just, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a friendly competition because it just came out of nowhere. It just it was, he, I guess he felt like he wanted to go at, go at homie. You know what I'm saying? And homie wasn't going for it. And at one point, Rick Ross signs Meek Mill. He signed and Meek Mill. He, it's crazy because he signed Meek Mill probably, damn, 2000 and maybe 11, maybe, I think. Maybe 10 or 11 or something like that. But, and that was, that was another thing I didn't like about the situation. Because me and me come from the same hood. You know, we both from the same city. And, you know, at the end of the day, Fifth is my man. Yayo is my man. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're my brothers. Like, I can get anything from them. They'll do anything for me. And in his defense, Ross is his man. Ross changed his life. And it, it got a bit tricky with me and Meek for a second it got uncomfortable because it was like, we knew like if we ever seen each other, we wasn't going to go at each other. Like it was, we wasn't going to do that, but we didn't like it. We didn't, it, it was, it was uncomfortable. We actually just had a conversation about that shit recently. You know what I'm saying? Because it was just an uncomfortable thing. Like, you know what I mean? But he understood that they were already going through it before he actually decided to with Ross. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, it just like was what it was. You know, it's kind of like knowing two people that know the same people and they both going through some shit. Yeah. Yeah, you know man. I mean? That was, uh, yeah. I, I can imagine that was probably pretty difficult for you guys. No, it was. It, it, it definitely was. And, and then it, it got difficult again later for me when him and Meek started to kind of like go through, go through it for a second. You know, only because it was just like... I. I didn't understand what was going on. And I wasn't here. I was in the feds. You know what I mean? I was just, it was uncomfortable. You know what I'm saying? But they worked it out. You know what I mean? They they talked and seen eye to eye or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? That's what men do. You know what I mean? And, and, and guess what? I just feel like even with this situation, when people, when, when, when they get physical with people, it's hard to turn that around to make it like, okay. You know what I'm saying? But when you going back, and you keep going back. All you're doing is making people on your side. You're just making people on your side upset. You're making people on my side upset. They don't want to hear that shit. They don't want to hear what you would have done to me. You know what I'm saying? Same way your people don't want to hear what I could have done to you or what I will do to you. You understand? Know Nobody wants to hear that shit. So it's like, leave that shit alone. If not, if you feel a way, then let's get in the ring and fix it. Easy. One of the things you're very well known for mm -hmm is your fight with Beanie Siegel. Right. Now, I, I know you guys have, you know, you guys have a good relationship now, mm -hmm. you know. So without, you know, getting into the specifics and everything, can you kind of take me through, uh, you know, what happened and everything that night? Yo, it, it, it's crazy because that fight is older than the shit with Gunplay. Very, very older. Like, that shit is like, I don't even remember that shit. All I remember is we got to fighting in that moment. You know what I'm saying? And 
we got to fight it, man. Like we we both ain't like what each other said, and it was like, well, fuck it, it is what it is, and we got to rip it. You know what I'm saying? And anybody know Philly niggas? Like you come from Philly, that's what we do first. We fight us. Like you know, I could walk out this interview and somebody could say something slick, and we could get the mix in. You know, it's different now, but at that time, that's just how it was. Um, it just was. Now the relationship that we have now was just an unfortunate, unfortunate situation then. But my thing be with these interviewers is like, I want them to ask him, ask him about it. They always ask me, ask him. Don't be afraid to ask him. The I, way, I would ask the way him. you're not afraid to ask, ask me, ask him. If if I enter, ever interview Beanie Siegel, I guarantee you I'd ask him, man. So all you got to do is ask him. And uh, okay, so uh, you guys getting you guys getting this crazy fight in this club, man? And mm -hmm. you know, uh, did you guys know each other before that? Yeah, we knew each other. We did music with each other before that. You know what I'm saying? I think we just got to understand it. That's all. And we know each we know people on both sides. I know people on his side. He know people on my side. You know, it was rough for a minute. We For a minute, the clubs wouldn't let me in if he was in there. They wouldn't let him in if I was in there. It was it was, it was, was a problem for a minute. You know what I'm saying? Like, we really was, like, at each other for a second. And then, you know, time, in that situation, Tom heal, heals all wounds. And through his cousin Pooh and, and his brother News, um, it just... We just got over that shit because I got a lot of love for them. You know what I mean? And me and him was cool. Like I said, you know, we was cool. And um, one day we seen each other. I think we was at the Electric Factory or some shit. J.D. Kissing them had something going on there. And we seen each other. And we just looked at each other and just bust out laughing. and hugged and it was just over. You know what I'm saying? We never, you know, it was just over. And I think we, we had conversations about it. It's like, it'd be like some shit like, Nigga, your hand is big as shit. But nigga, your hand is big as shit. Like, it'd be like funny shit for us, like that people probably will understand. But we don't really, we don't, we, don't, we don't care about that shit. You know what I'm saying? I hope the youth look at that situation and be like, damn, them two went through it. If they could squash it, we could squash some shit. You know what I mean? What, what year was this? Woo! 2004? Like four or five? Roughly. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I seen somewhere that you brought Beanie Siegel to G Unit and put some records together with Fifty Cent. Yeah. So what happened was, um, we was in Philly. Fifth was in Philly. We was in a Risk Carlton hotel, and he was putting out what album was coming out. I want to say, I want to say, uh. I want to say, I want to say Curtis album. Yeah, I want to say Curtis album. And he was like, yo, you got the nigga Bean's number? And I'm like, yeah. And he knew what happened. He knew like what we had uh, been through. And he was like, you call a nigga? Tell him to come to the station. And at that moment, I could have said, no, I ain't have his number. You know what I'm saying? I could have been like, man, I ain't f that nigga. But I didn't wear my heart on my sleeve. You understand what I'm saying? And I called him like, yo, come to the radio station. Homie wanna holler at you. And he like, huh? He like, all right, now? I'm like, yeah, we here now. And then he came and, you know what I mean? Then I took him to the office the next day and he played records for him. And, um, you know, that's when they did they they did a few records together. But um, Beans ended up uh, going to jail after that. You know, the taxes thing came and, you know, there was a lot of, lot of, lot of shit that went on. That's right. You're right. He did go to jail not yeah. too long after that. And then I uh, went in. And then you, and you ended up going to jail. So yeah. At, at one point, you went, right after the BET Awards of 2012, you end up going for. Uh, well, how long were you in jail? Uh, uh, like seven years. Seven I out, years. I went in 2012. I got out. What's that? I went in 2012. I got out 2019. April. Damn. 
Can, can you talk about what you got busted for and what you're charged? Well, they for? had me in a, under a conspiracy for a bank fraud case. So what happened was, I was involved in something, got out of it, and a person pulled me back in by wearing a wire on me. And when they had the conversation with me, basically whatever they had already told the feds, when they had the conversation with me about me talking and being aware of what they were talking about, that showed that I was, that they were being truthful about them already telling them on, telling on me. So that gave me conspiracy to uh, the whole case, which made me number two in the indictment. And uh, they indicted me. They indicted me. Yeah. Okay, so, so you get indicted, mm -hmm. and do you fight the case? Do you take a deal? Well, me and my co-defender, our whole thing was to fight in the beginning. But... Once we seen everything that they had against us, it didn't make sense to fight it in my eyes. You know what I mean? Uh, he kind of struggled with it a little bit, but I knew that I couldn't take a deal without, I, I knew I couldn't take the deal if he didn't take the deal. Because if I take the deal, then I'm pleading to everything that they saying we did. And if he's going to trial, they're going to say, well, he already pleaded to everything, saying this is what y'all did. You and him did. Because, you know, in the feds, you get a PSI. You get, like, they they tell you everything per count, and they build the story on who was doing what, how it was going, who was aiding the bed and who, who picked this person. Who, so it was the entire story. So in order for me to get uh, a lesser sentence, I would have to plead to that without no cooperating on anybody but I would have to plead to those charges. And if I did that and he didn't, they could use his role and what I pleaded to against him at trial. So we decided to plead to, you know, together to plead, you know what I'm saying? So I, I, um, I pleaded one day, he pleaded the next day behind me. And then I, we both got sentenced on the same day, but like two hours apart. Because everybody else in our case, besides um, maybe one, two, like maybe three people, three other people didn't tell. But um, yeah, there was a person that wore a wire on me. There was a female from, um, there was this girl from Jersey. She told on him, um, she told him I'm bad. She told him, you know, I didn't, I didn't even know. Her. I knew her of her, but I didn't know her like that. But yeah, she told. So, uh, you know, you've been to jail mm -hmm. uh, before G Unit, and now you're going to jail in the middle of. And it. you're from G Unit in the middle of my shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm going Fifty Cent, man. I mean, you know, mogul. Mm -hmm. You know, huge man. You know, what's it like for you now in jail, being from G Unit? Um, it's crazy because. Like I said, people don't understand when you're in the streets and you walk away from something that you, it can still come back to you. You know what I'm saying? Because I was actually out of it. I wasn't even doing it no more. So it was just like, it was already an investigation and, and it came back in the midst of things going on for me. So when I went to jail, I was, I was f***ed up behind it. I was, I was, I couldn't believe it. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't believe like, damn, they told on me and. This shit coming up and this shit is old and I'm like, damn. So, you know, I had to face the music that my music career wasn't going to be. I didn't even, like, even before I went to jail, I didn't even know if 50 and them was even going to f*** with me no more. You know what I mean? Because of my past shit. And they supported me every step of the way. Like, you know, he 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 gave me money towards my lawyer. Um, He was even trying to put up money for me not to go to jail. But the lawyer couldn't guarantee that if the money was paid back, that I wouldn't go to jail. And he looked at me and I'm like, nah, bro, I'm going to just go do what I got to do because I don't want to have this man put up a quarter of a million dollars for me and I still go to jail. And then when I come home, it's like, I'm just a nigga that went to jail and you wasted a quarter million dollars on it and you can't get your, you didn't get your money back from like, who wants to see that, see that nigga? You know what I'm saying? 
So I, I didn't want to be that. You know, and people don't understand like so much that so he's done so much uh, for me, you know, opportunities, sending me money, sending me a sprinter when I got out, coming to see me in Philly when I got out, being in my video, just doing different things. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, when you when you got a person like that or people like that in your life, you're supposed to be there to do anything they, they may need you to do. You know what I'm saying? So whether it's uh, uh, rapping, security, assistant, uh, making this run, being there, whatever it may be, that's what I'm willing to do for my people because that's just the loyalty in me. They didn't have to do shit for me. You know what I mean? I'm not just like that with them. I'm like that with people that y'all don't even see, like my cousin who's sitting behind the scenes. I'm like that with him. So it's like, you know, and my family and my loved ones. So I'm like that with everybody. So when people say little shit, oh, he 50 security, he this, he that. Yeah, but I'm seeing the world. You know what I'm saying? I'm, 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 le I'm leveling up. I've made more money doing shit than other niggas have done doing that shit. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, I may be security doing this. I'm an artist here. I'm a manager here. I'm an entrepreneur here. I'm an owner here. It's like, I got I wear multiple hats. And when you're in this industry, you can't wear one hat because you ain't going to get no more nothing. You're only going to get one, one check. So you got to get in where you fit in with this shit. I see you were in the same jail as Southwest T. Yep. I was in the same jail as Southwest T. We was in Fort Dix together. Me and T was in a hole together. We used to talk through the vent. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, what was that like? Crazy. Now, me being in the jail, I can say that I had some moments in the jail where I had to get busy. You know what I'm saying? Um... Cause jail is jail, man. Like I ain't want to run around in jail looking like uh, the man and, and 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 looking like you know, like I just like I ain't want to do that. You know what I mean? So I, I, I wouldn't care. I'd be in that joint woofing, walking around. People be like, "50 and I don't with that nigga." They don't fuck with him like that. He ain't man that nigga. Look, they or or they cut him off, all because I'm not running around buying every pair of sneakers that come on commissary. Buying every sweatsuit that come on commissary to look cute for a bunch of niggas. I didn't care about that shit. I just wanted to get the f out of there. So, you know, I had a few times where I had to get busy and handle my business, but I didn't get played with. I didn't get played with like that. Do you have any stories or anything with Southwest T you could share? Um, The phones. We was getting the phones. We was getting the phones in there sending the phones over, because he was on the west side. He know the vibes, he was on the west side, I was on the east side, you know what I mean? I don't want to say too much, because if people were in them joints, they're still doing what they do that's provide for their family, so all I'm going to say is, you know, we was doing us. Now you get out of jail, and uh -huh. you know what do you do with yourself when you get out of jail? Do you go you know, straight back to, uh, to the music? Um, I did. I did. At first, I wasn't, though. But people kept telling me, yo, you should do it, you should do it, you should do it. And then I had the support of my family. I had the support of my, you know, my close friends, my cousin. Um, and I still had the G on the support. You know what I mean? They sent the Sprinter for me. As soon as I got in the Sprinter, the cameras was dead. 50 was on FaceTime. So it was just like, let's go. You know, all I needed to do was just come with the record and, and just get busy. And I think for me, it was like... It was so much happening so fast that I had to kind of pace myself. But it was, yeah, that's that's what made me get back in it, though. The support. People really got to have support. You know, when you go in them jails, man, it get a little different. So, you know, coming out, you, you be wondering what's going to be there for you. You know you got to get your feet to the ground and get it, especially when you're a hustler. So I knew that I had to, um, to make some things happen. And the tour, that tour that I was telling you that I did with him, that was like one of the first things that we did. After I got out the halfway house and they gave me permission to travel and all that stuff, that was the first thing I did, the tour. Uh, what is, so what all are you working on right now? Um, right now, I got my own independent label called 1722 Music Group. Um, my first placement was um, Work the Block. I got that put inside the Power TV show. Um, I'm booking artists now, work, working a lot with different artists 
and uh, different actors like Michael Rainey from Power and uh, Joseph Secor from Power. And, you know, just doing booking things and, you know, getting artists going and just doing things on the, on the death side of things on top of still doing music. You know what I mean? Just just hustling, just getting it wherever it's at because there's so many like little pockets you could go in in this music and make money, whether it be placements, whether it be uh, 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 publishing, writing, you know, getting getting people deals, label deals. It's like so many things going on in Philly. So many people in great positions, you know, and connecting people together and making things just just work. So that's what my focus be right now. So you're working with a lot of the guys from Power. Yeah. Yeah, I do a lot of stuff like, you know, booking for shows. You know what I mean? I do a lot of a lot of different things, man. And it's been it's been good. It's been good. It's a so great like place. what they'll like show up to the club and get like a club fee or yeah. something like that? Yeah, they come out, hang out in the club, you know, like they, people want to see them. You know what I mean? So I, I'll do that. Um I'm the guy, I'm the go to guy. You know, you might be like, yo, I need to get with such and such. You might call me. It's gonna be a fee though, but I'm gonna get you there. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's that's what I'm on right now. And building up my own label and, you know, grabbing artists and, you know what I mean, being in these different labels. And I got people in different major labels in, in, in these in these in New York and in Cali. So I'm able to just do what I need to do. OK, man, that's what's up. Yeah. man. That's that's a lot of good stuff coming out. man. And I got you a got, partnership got... with my man, Jerry Wonder. Um, got the studio in New York, Platinum Sounds, Wonder Music. So, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff together. We put some EPs out. You know, we're gonna put some more music out, put out some more artists, you know what I mean? And really, really get shit done, man. We trying to work this year. This summer, we're we gonna turn it up. Do you ever go while they're recording power? Are you involved in power at all? Involved, I would say no, not involved, but I've been around it, yeah. I've been around it. I see, I see how it go and what they do is very quiet on set. And, you know what I mean? They be hands on, but like, I don't got nothing to do with it. No right and no none of that. That's they thing. Power's dope, man. I yeah. love power. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy for me. I think it's more crazy to actually kick it with the actors offset to like they because you gotta understand they acting, so their personalities from is different from when they are on screen. They cool though, you know what I mean. But it's it's, it's just different and 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 like uh, Joseph. Joseph Sakura, which who plays Tommy on Power, is really, really my guy. Like he's really, really a close friend. Uh, of mine. Shout out to Renee too. Um, they, those are like my my bros right there. Like we really got like a real serious bond, and you know we just be talking about a lot of things with film and you know production companies and different movies that he got coming, and you know everybody got something that they working on that they excited about. So just to be in the mix, I'm still learning. You know what I mean? Being around a lot of stuff and. You know, of course, you learn stuff being around fifth, but you got to be a hustler in this. You can't just look for somebody to just hang you nothing. You got to get out there and get it yourself. You know what I mean? So building the relationships, I got a lot of great relationships. And this is why I say this thing with gunplay is so irritating to me because I'm building a brand. I'm, I'm somewhere else, but I am who I am. You understand what I'm saying? But I'm building a brand and I'm, I'm moving on to try to do bigger and better things and not get caught up in this street shit. You know what I mean? That's where everybody, like, what are we rapping for? What do we come in entertainment for? Do we come in entertainment to show that we just these super duper street guys and what, go to jail? I went to jail back and forth. How many more times I'm gonna go to jail before they say we not letting you out here ever again? So for me, I'm in this to win. I'm not in this to be out here. Like now they see rapper, you know what they say? Indictment or die, one or the other. That's all they seeing. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like, my my initial reaction to any situation, I'm going to stick my chest out because I'm not going to let nobody play with me. But at the end of the day, like my man say, if it's not a problem, it's no problem. If it's a problem, then we'll address the problem. Well, that's what it is, man. You know? Man, Mike, I appreciate you, man. For sure. For sure. You know, dope history, uh, you know, dope interview, dope stories, man. No doubt. You know, uh, man, I, I just appreciate you taking the time. For sure, man. Look, more music is to come. Get ready. My label, 1722 Music Group. Get ready. You see, you see the merch. It's right here, right? Just, 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 get, just get ready, man. It's coming. That's what it is. All right, bro. Oh, yeah, my social media. I got to tell you my social media. 
uh, Instagram at Mike Knox official. That's M I K E K N O X official. Again, Mike Knox official. M I K E K N O X official. Um, Twitter's the same. They got this new thing now uh, through Instagram. It's like. Shit, thread, Twitch? threads or Twitch? something? Twitch, Twitch, just something like that. I think I, I don't know. I forget the name, but I'm on there too. You know what I mean? But like I said, just get ready. New music coming. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm working on. A, I'm working on a film too. I got a film coming too. I'm working on that, and um, I'm looking for artists. I'm always looking for artists. I'm looking for singers too, producers, everything. Like we want the whole full throttle. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to the whole Philly. Shout out to, uh, man, shout out to everybody that support me. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to uh, Stack the Star of Records. Shout out to Big Money Records. Um, everybody in Philly that's doing anything, Gillian Wallow. You know what I'm saying? Just shout out to the whole Philly, man. Shout out to Cosby Kev. Without you, I wouldn't even be here. Shout out to Ye Fifth, the whole unit. Y'all already know. I know what it is. Shout out to my cousin, cousin Ray. You know what I mean? He don't do, do too much talking, but. Y'all know what it is. Until next time, man. I don't know how this going to go, but until next time, hopefully I ain't got to. My man. For sure, for sure, man. Hopefully, yeah. man. All right. Definitely. For sure. All right, bro. All right, one. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone News.